This is Professor Frink, full name John I.Q. Nerdlebaum Frink Jr. He is Springfield's most prolific scientist and inventor of dozens of useful and not so useful devices. These include the Gambletron 2000, the Frink X7, the AT5000 auto dialer, a sarcasm detector, and most importantly, hamburger earmuffs. He had a rather frosty relationship with his father, John Frink Sr., as well as an extraordinarily chaotic love life. Oh god, it's another one of these Simpsons histories. Hold on to your glavens, it's going to be a bumpy ride. This is the history of Professor Frink. Professor Frink, Professor Frink, he'll make you laugh, he'll make you think. Or does he? Well, yeah, those are his two basic roles on the show. Frink is one of those secondary characters that isn't known for being especially deep, rarely forming personal bonds with other characters on the show. Like, for example, you wouldn't expect a Homer and Frink buddy comedy, for example. So what exactly has The Simpsons done with this guy for 30-something seasons? Invention jokes and that's it? Or, much like the nutty professor, is this a character that is full of surprises? Let's go back to the beginning to figure it out. Professor Frank is another member of the Season 2 Club, making his first appearance in Old Money as one of the folks asking for Grandpa's cash. It's a pretty strange start for a couple different reasons. First of all, he invented this death ray prototype that can only be used for evil applications, playing on a more sinister scientist archetype than usual. Later on, we see him making a toy into a weapon in Season 11, and he says he once produced napalm for the Vietnam War. But generally, Frink is more of a peacetime scientist, sticking to consumer products and research. The other weird thing about this introduction is that Frink refers to his wife hating this invention. So in these early days, this guy was married. Frink is an unusual case for Simpsons histories, as his confusing relationship stuff is right at the beginning. Early Professor Frank was clearly a family man, as we meet his son in the season 3 finale. Or at least, we watch this kid go flying out a window. He then remarks that his wife is going to kill him. Thankfully, we know that Frank's son did not perish in this plane crash, as we see him again in the season 15 BattleBots homage. Or at least, I'm assuming this is the same kid. As for Professor Frank's wife, she remains a mystery. He is never seen living with another person, and is portrayed as a bachelor in countless later episodes. It's possible that this scientist in Season 6 is actually Frink's wife, as they are more than ready to hook up after drinking Grandpa's tonic. On the other hand, she specifically calls him Professor, and I don't know how many married couples use these honorifics with each other, unless there is some weird academia kink I am unaware of. I think it's safe to say that Frink's mysterious wife divorced him. She didn't like the death ray, he crashed their son through her window. Yeah, Frink is definitely paying alimony at this point. Actually, this theory makes some sense, as Frink immediately goes into money-making mode in these early years. He's working for Tipsy McStagger to find the secret ingredient, is showing off his Gambletron 2000 on TV, is interviewed about rescuing Timmy O'Toole, and describing the various painful meltdown deaths they will experience. Back then, there was a little more of Dr. Nick in Professor Frank's characterization. He will always be a klutz whose experiments will blow up in his face, but in seasons 3 through 5, he exhibits very little competence in any field. In season 4, he's suggesting a ridiculous fantastic voyage into Homer's colon, or is pitching grassy knoll conspiracies. Season 5 has this giant teddy bear going haywire, and his home security system immediately crashing and burning. But hey, at least Frank somehow managed to sell one of these systems. I hope they bought the insurance. Season 6 is a slight improvement for him, as he does predict the itchy and scratchy robots betraying them, but forgets to carry the one and messes up the timing. His plan to destroy Bart's comet also goes haywire, but he does at least make a good demonstration, Moe's bar be damned. Here's where they finally name him Professor Frank, by the way. Otherwise, he's inventing a ridiculously sour lemon ball, offering rides on his hover bike, working on the cure for 17 stab wounds, and teaching these kindergartners how to properly enjoy their toys. Season 6 is also around where the Jerry Lewis mannerisms became especially pronounced. They were always there with the performance, but now his dialogue has changed, with the lists and the rambling and the over-the-top ending. He's interrupting his speech with glares and stuff. Essentially, the Hoiven Glaven has officially begun. 
Season 7 is probably Professor Frank's big coming out party as a character. Here's where we get the Homer Cubed Halloween segment, where Frank gets to take center stage, really spell things out to the audience, and direct some of the action. Unfortunately, he misses most of 22 short films about Springfield due to his lab monkeys, but at least he got to close things out. We also learn that his first name is John, named after John Frank, who later became a writer on the show. In Much A Poo About Nothing, we get even more backstory. He was a Poo's teacher at shit, showing off his Frinky X7 machine, and proclaiming that computers will someday ruin the fun of romantic conquest. Jeez, between this and the Fantastic Voyage joke, it's like Frink is predicting his future Spotlight episodes. Still waiting on a story featuring a debigulator and or rebigulator. Frink briefly fell into the background in Season 8, only getting significant roles in the Treehouse of Horror and the Auto Dialer B plot in Lisa's Date with Density. This appearance does demonstrate, though, how much Frink has changed since the early days. He's not a family man with an evil death ray. Now he plays chess against robots and invents autodialers to tell people about snow days. The Mike Scully era, seasons 9 through 12, was a pretty good time for Professor Frank overall. They were building on previous seasons' momentum to get him involved in more stories. For example, there were more episodes where his invention either kick off the plot or are needed to keep it going. Haggling with Homer over his transporter leads to the events of Fly vs. Fly. His electronic horn helps the police find the kid's radio signal. He gives Homer advice on how to become an inventor. Mr. Burns kidnaps him to find the Loch Ness Monster. Too bad he brought his frog exaggerator instead. In Last Tap Dance in Springfield, Frank fashions Lisa's shoes into tapping automatically. See how the shoes are clearly set to the on position? We started getting some comic book guy being written into Professor Frank, expanding his scientific bent to more generalized nerdiness. Y'all know that a wizard did it meme? Well, Frank was the setup man, thanks to a question about a horse. At a later convention, he comments on a cartoon character sounding suspiciously like Jerry Lewis. Nice. We're getting Frank in more diverse settings, mixing it up with more of the cast. He's part of the Mensa group, and they save Lisa's brain, dressing up like a jester, banning sports where he may have to take off his shirt, and inventing a sarcasm detector. Or he'll show up in smaller roles, like getting on Lenny's case in line at the post office, playing basketball with his flubber-infused shoes, asking Bart to cure the cramp in his glavin, getting attacked at a Thanksgiving Day parade, and getting thrown over Homer's trash can. Like a lot of characters in the Scully era, Frink took quite a few beatings at the hands of the writers, most of which were self-inflicted. Thus far, Professor Frank has had some memorable cameos in the early days, and built some momentum in the Oakley and Weinstein and Mike Scully eras, but Frank is definitely one of those late bloomer Simpsons characters who reached peak prominence during the Al Jean era, starting in season 13. Like, he didn't change dramatically characterization-wise, he's pretty much a known commodity by this time, but as the plots became more outlandish, Professor Frank became more and more useful. And because his personal life was still relatively unexplored, there were still brand new story possibilities. For example, Trials of Horror 14 examined Professor Frank's relationship with his father, played by none other than Jerry Lewis himself. His dad was a He-Man adventurous scientist who didn't get along with his geeky son. After his death, Frank reanimated him. It does not go well. But at the very least, he stops him from going on a rampage and the two reconcile in the end. Interestingly, even though this is a non-canonical Halloween segment, the writers did stick with this bit of backstory. We've seen John Frink Sr.'s picture on the wall on multiple occasions. And in season 31, we learned that his parents were chemists with absolutely no romantic chemistry between them. And Frink was the world's second test tube baby. This seems to run in the family, as Professor Frink has very little chemistry with any of the ladies either. In season 14, we overhear him making sweet love to one of his robots, causing it to explode. Oh wow, we got to the robot sex part of Simpson Histories early this time. Good job, writers. Spoiler warning, but this is a pretty consistent trend with old Professor Frank. Pretty sure this guy's got a dozen notches on his robotic bedpost at this point. By season 27, he's inexplicably building mother robots to disapprove of him. It's gone so far. Professor Frank is secretly the freakiest freak in series history, and the less I know, the happier I am. There's definitely a streak of loneliness written into Professor Frank's characterization. Robots serve as his lovers and card-playing friends, 
and even his programmed friends don't seem that excited about hanging out with him. In season 18, he adopts a bird from The Simpsons because he gets so lonely in the lab, and later installs a doggy door for his teacup poodle. In a documentary, he regrets his career choice as he spent his whole life in a lab and never spoke to a girl. He literally builds a time machine to go tell his younger self to change career paths. It does not go well. In season 27, Professor Frank gets an entire spotlight episode about his problems with his love life. After getting super depressed and hung over about not having a date to a party, Frank decides to use the scientific method to figure out how women could find him desirable. He gets shoe lifts and incredibly jarring blue contacts, neither of which work. Then he installs a voice chip, which makes him sound smooth and seductive. Basically, it's the old buddy love thing again. Frank's going to yoga class and getting all those digits. He hooks up with Kuki Kwan, her cousin Nuki Kwan, yes, this is a real joke, also Miss Hoover, and dozens of other ladies. He is able to fill up an entire banquet hall with them. In the end, Frank realizes that other men are as lonely as him, and he puts together an algorithm to find everyone else's perfect matches. As for Frank, intellectual pursuits are his love. Is that what we're calling it now? Anyway, in season 31, Frank gets another spotlight episode, this time focusing on his platonic relationships. Frank invents a new cryptocurrency, Frankcoin, and becomes a billionaire. However, after his blockchain success, he finds himself depressed and emotionally empty. Lisa asks Homer to invite him to Moe's. Frank helps them all win at trivia and quickly becomes a part of their gang. He treats them to so many fun and expensive adventures. But once again, Frank gets depressed again at the thought of his new friends just using him for his money. Through a series of tests, he discovers none of them truly like Frank on a personal level. In the end, through some kind of weird crypto formula shenanigan, Frank declares Lisa is his best friend because she knows him the best. This episode is so weird. It ends with Frank making out with the humanities professor that he shares an office with. You know what would be crazy? If this entire time, Frank was still actively married to his wife from season two. Oh boy, would that change things about this character study. The point is, the show wasn't painting Professor Frank as being a complete loner or something, like we've seen him hanging out with the other nerds, participating in Homer's Fantasy Football League, partying during adult Halloween. In season 23, there's this joke about him canceling his date with Miss Wyoming, who is totally obsessed with him. We've seen Frank's creative side on a few occasions. He's part of Homer and Bart's book writing crew in The Book Job. He puts in an amazing lead performance in Marge's hip-hop musical about Jebediah Springfield. He even pitched in as an advisor in Marge's candidacy for mayor. Frank was more successful than ever in the later seasons. No one really thinks of Professor Frank as this brooding, melancholic character. It's just that all of his major spotlight episodes tended to put the focus on the lonely man behind the machines. Outside of these special cases, Frank's bread and butter continued to be his technical prowess and wacky inventions. In fact, there is an argument that Frank is one of the most influential Simpsons characters of the later years in terms of making things happen. There are plenty of stories that can only happen because of some magical Frank shenanigan. Like in Treehouse of Horrors, he'll show up with a handy time machine, have the technology to do a Fantastic Voyage or Jurassic Park parody, in season 16, we get to see Bart and Lisa's future as teenagers thanks to Frank's astrology machine. In Eternal Moonshine of the Simpson Mind, Homer visits Frank's institute that allows him to explore his prior memories like a certain movie. In How I Wet Your Mother, he invents a machine that allows the Simpson family to go inside of Homer's dreams like a certain movie. Also, he discovers hell is real and everyone goes there. Also, also, he has a super exciting slow motion, regular motion fight with Chief Wiggum. In Days of Future Future, Frank clones Homer repeatedly and, after running out of clones, uploads his consciousness via USB. Geez, just realized that Frank has got to know every corner of Homer's psyche by now. He has tapped into it so many times. In Season 29's Frank Gets Testy, he develops the PVQ, a number that measures a person's overall ability, socially, intellectually, and emotionally. He even gets a big song and dance number about it. Despite its name, this one isn't technically a Frank Spotlight episode. Instead, it turns into this thing about Bart and Lisa feeling insecure about their test scores. But we do learn of Frank's shame into barely getting into the lowest ranked Ivy League school. 
and Mr. Burns builds a giant spaceship to live on another planet. Starting to notice that the more Professor Frank plays into the story, the more cuckoo bananas the episode will be. Want to do a virtual reality episode with Mr. Burns? Here comes the Oculus Frank. In more minor appearances, he will simply act as the bridge character who will explain what the story is about. He teaches Lisa about light pollution, then he teaches Lisa about dying bees, and starts Lisa's bizarre bee beard adventure. He introduces Lisa to sabermetrics, so she can torture her baseball team with statistics. At Christmas, he explains how they are the only town with snow. During the Futurama crossover, he gives advice regarding Bender, and later works with Professor Farnsworth, who views him as extremely, extremely stupid. Hell, you could argue that he's the one who kicks off Bart's jealousy of Lisa during Barthood in Season 27. I think there's an argument that no other character benefited more from 30 seasons of The Simpsons than Professor Frank. As time marches on, the show will inevitably tackle emerging technologies and have a new movie parody that requires a magical plot device. This Simpsons history quickly turned into a field trip through the weirdest and most gimmicky Simpsons episodes ever. Somehow, there are plenty of cases where the writers actually tap the brakes with Frank, using a different scientist or a guest star. Like, I definitely think of Professor Frank as an Al Jean character, but I wouldn't say he's overexposed or anything. He just reached the levels of, like, Groundskeeper Willie, rather than being down with the sea captains of the world. Professor Frank kind of feels like a cross between Wayland Smithers and Comic Book Guy. He exists in that spectrum of character archetypes, where he'll introduce a plot and guide it in a direction like Smithers, but plays into the nerdy commentary world of Comic Book Guy. He's like a nicer, more proactive comic book guy. I have to admit though, I've never personally been a big Professor Frink fan, partially because his mannerisms make him such a Jerry Lewis pastiche, and I've never gravitated toward that specific brand of shtick. That being said, I think there's something to be said for Hank Azaria's performance for this guy. Kind of like with Snake, his voice does make this character so iconic and memorable. This guy back in Old Money could have easily been this random one-off character and gotten lost in the Season 2 shakeout. But The Simpsons obviously needed a role like this, to go on the news with Kent Brockman and explain things to City Hall. Professor Frink can be forced into a lot of these dry, expository roles. I think it's a real credit to Frink that rarely do these sequences feel boring, that he has such a quirky, entertaining personality to keep the scene moving. That's essentially what you need with this kind of character. Introduce the plot, convey your personality, and then get out of the way. You cut away to Sideshow Mel if you want something dramatic, you cut away to Professor Frank for something topical. Because of his hyper-topical focus, I still remain skeptical about Frank relationship episodes. He's such a wacky cutaway character that he struggles in selling any kind of emotional conflict. But I appreciate that they went there with Frank in these later years, that we do have a better sense of his loneliness and his search for knowledge. I like that old Frinky has branched out to doing musical numbers and book heists. Professor Frank's never going to be my personal cup of tea, but I have definitely come to appreciate him more after going into his history. Let me know in the comments what you think of Professor Frank and your favorite moments of his. Does being a Jerry Lewis superfan make this guy with all the hoiv and glavin even better? Does Professor Frank's wacky storylines add some spice to these lighter seasons? I actually really like those Eternal Sunshine and Inception parodies, as weird as they are. Also, let me know in the comments who you would like to see for the next Simpsons Histories. Nominations last time were kinda all over the place. There is currently momentum behind Mayor Quimby, Rainier Wolfcastle, The Wiggums, more of the Springfield Elementary crew. We could also go more obscure, like Janie or the Sea Captain or Martin's dad or something. Maybe it's finally time to tackle Shelbyville. Let your voice be heard. I love a good character pitch. As always, thanks for watching.